why don't we start by having each of you just describe briefly what it is that you do and what your company does. Would you like me to start? Sure. <coughs> sure. Um, so my name is Kayvon Pierastani. I represent the institutional business of Coinbase based in New York City. I've been with the firm about nine, ten months. Before Coinbase, I had a career on the sell side in the equity derivative space. Um, I've got a computer science background. I've been investing in Bitcoin since 2013. Um, so a quick, I guess a quick snapshot on who Coinbase is and, and what we do within the crypto ecosystem. So as most of you are probably aware, Coinbase was born in 2012, around the time that Bitcoin was going from being that hobbyist type thing that Olaf mentioned earlier, hobbyist type plaything, into enjoying a broader widespread retail adoption. So Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, uh, created Coinbase to make a platform to make it as easy as possible for anyone, expert and layman alike, to easily buy and sell Bitcoin and to safely store it in our third party hosted wallet. Um, we then in 2015, around the time that family offices, high net worth investors and prop trading firms were starting to trade crypto, uh, crypto assets in higher volumes, we launched a platform called GDAX which is uh, exclusively focused on institutional investors and professional traders. And then at the end of last year, as the importance of custody to the crypto ecosystem became apparent, Coinbase announced a new product called Coinbase Custody. And I'm pleased to say that as early as next week, we'll be rolling out Coinbase Custody to the first set of customers. So that's who Coinbase is uh, broadly in terms of our products and services. In terms of the role we play within the crypto ecosystem, most people think of Coinbase as that so-called on-ramps business, from traditional finance or fiat currencies into the world of crypto finance, or what we like to call Finance 2.0. And it's true that a lot of Coinbase's business today revolves around these on-ramp type offerings, but ultimately this is not what Coinbase is as a company. Coinbase's broader mission as a crypto first company is to identify the best crypto technologies and applications available in the world today, to foster their development, and then to bring them to as many people as possible to create a more open financial system. And this includes technologies such as identity on the blockchain, stable coins, uh, decentralized exchanges and relays, and so on. These are all things that the folks in headquarters in San Francisco are looking at. Great, Tim. Great, Tim McCourt, um, Global Head of Equity Index, <clears throat> excuse me, and Alternative Investment Products at CME Group. Uh, I've been with CME for about five years. My background prior to that, I was an equity index trader uh, for about 13 years. And what we do at CME with respect to being the, the world's largest you know, derivatives exchange and, and operating a futures and options on a futures exchange, where we fit in with respect to the cryptocurrency uh, really goes back to 2016 when we first announced the launch of the Bitcoin reference rate. Uh, which is a reference rate that tracks the aggregate U.S. dollar value of, of one Bitcoin. Uh, and we can kind of talk a little bit about that later. But that was launched in uh, November of 2016. And then most recently in December of 2017, we launched a Bitcoin futures uh, based on that reference rate. Uh, and we operate it in the same way as a lot of our other futures products where we operate the central marketplace. It's essentially a cleared product. It's regulated. Uh, and in terms of offering that U.S. dollar financial contract on the Bitcoin reference rate to the ecosystem, I think how I would describe CME Group's role currently uh, as the financial industry and the, the broader marketplace is looking to risk manage those risks associated with Bitcoin is we're bringing a certain amount of familiarity uh, to the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency risk management in the way of offering a futures product that looks and feels and operates a lot like the other products, but just now tracks a new and unique underlying asset uh, called Bitcoin. Michael? Uh, Michael Morrow. I'm the CEO of Genesis Trading, uh, which is a New York-based uh, SEC and FINRA registered broker-dealer um, and one of the largest over-the-counter market makers in, in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, we started market making in 2013. Um, and uh, so you can consider us the on-ramp, off-ramp broker-dealer um, for hedge funds and other institutional accounts as they look to gain exposure to Bitcoin. Um, separately, um, in uh, earlier this year, we launched a business called Genesis Capital. Um, over the years, it's sort of become apparent, um, it's always been apparent, I suppose, of the need for borrow on cryptocurrencies. Um, whether it be to, to hedge exposure um, on, on, on the markets, that the, uh, the futures that are sort of traded at the CME, or they're playing in the options market. Um, they Maybe they play in the public equities under the GBTC, 
or they're just bearish on Bitcoin in general and are looking to kind of short it. Um, we created Genesis Capital, um, which is an institutional lending business that provides uh, crypto borrow to institutions that are looking for either working capital or to hedge their risks around, gen uh, around digital currencies. And so we launched that business in February um, of, uh, of this year. Um, and so it's only been a few months kind of up and running, but reception has been very strong. And we believe very, very strongly in that. Um, even though at, its, at our core, um, we are bullish on the cryptocurrency sector, um, two-way price discovery is of essence of, of utmost importance as this as the class grows up. And I think it's important for folks to express the other side of the trade should they want to um, permanently or at least temporarily. And I think that's what Genesis Capital is willing to do. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Hugh Leung. So as Laurie said, six months ago, I was the senior managing director of State Street running after his emerging technology center. And now I'm the founder of a new startup called OmniX. We, are, we like to think of ourselves as the first large-scale institutionally focused investment and trading platform for crypto assets. Notice I didn't say cryptocurrencies, and I'll come back to that some other point. Um, but I didn't start my life within State Street, and I'm not a banker by training. Um, in early 2000s, I was one of the earliest people at a Silicon Valley startup called Kernex. Some of you guys here actually probably know that company. So we were, at that time, was the first company to create this large-scale multi-bank electronic platform for currencies for the institutional space, replacing telephones, uh, electronic multi-bank discovery, as the prime brokers shifted into the FXPV business, we shifted our technology to really keep up with the active and high-frequency trading shops. So we became the largest high-frequency routing mechanism for currencies. Every investment bank, every Chicago high-frequency guy was on board. By middle of 2000, we were routing about 50, 60 billion per day. And State Street acquired us in 2007. So I've been in State Street for the last 10 years. I ran a bunch of electronic business for the US. I ran all of the Asia Pacific electronic platforms business. And I started this emerging technology center three years ago until I left six months ago. So during that time, we explored a lot about blockchain and crypto. And within the last year or so, so many of State Street's clients have been coming to us, particularly the lab, asking about what is crypto? You know, is it the blockchain technology? Is it a new asset class? If I want to put a huge amount of pension or asset into it, how do I custody it? How do I trade it? Um, I mean, these are big, big institutions, right? Guys like Wellington that just came out a few months ago talking about it. And what I realized is there isn't such a platform, right? Crypto is an industry or a phenomenon that really started from the retail side and institutional side are playing catch up. So what I'm doing is taking the experience that I had the last 15 years in terms of a startup, financial service startup, all the way to institutional finance and creating this platform that connects all the different venues together. So we're not a market maker, we're not an exchange, we're not a custodian, we're not a fund administrator, but uh, we're launching the platform in about a month we're connected to hopefully all the places that are uh, that are on the panel right now. Right. So Olaf was talking about the infrastructure of Web 3.0, which is quite a different thing from the kind of infrastructure we're going to be discussing on this panel. As you can see here on this panel, we've got kind of a range of people who are kind of a little bit more on the crypto side, and then others that really come more from Wall Street. And we're talking about sort of the infrastructure that needs to be built to bring those two worlds together. So I just want to get kind of the big picture from you guys. Where would you say the state of infrastructure is currently? I'll take a shot. Any, you know, <laughs> okay. any of you can go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to start on that. I, mean, I, I think the institutional infrastructure for access to whether it's blockchain or crypto as an asset class really is non-existent at this point, right? Some people, I think two, three years ago, have said blockchain and crypto is like the internet of the 90s. It is absolutely not the internet of the 90s. It's about the 70s or the 80s at earliest. And, and we do have this divide between what people think as cryptocurrencies and Bitcoins, the decentralization that is gonna completely get rid of our centralized way of doing things, to what the pension funds, the asset managers, large hedge funds like you guys, um, think that you can do with crypto, whether it's a technology or an investment. But I think in the last year or so, um, there's been a huge change in the landscape and really building that infrastructure, whether it's institutional exchanges like GDAX, CME getting in, people like my company coming out with the background of building that, and of course, you know, guys like Genesis has been there forever. Um, there's lots of these things that are being built right now. It's not gonna happen overnight, right? So the question about is this gonna change the world Right now, no, it is not. But it is looking uh, into that windshield rather than the rear view mirror. Yeah, I think for crypto to be considered a mature asset class, there's three key infrastructural requirements that need to be met. The first is trading venues. 
I think judging by the dozens, if not hundreds, of crypto exchanges around the world today, I think we've made good progress there, although there's still work to do. The second requirement infrastructurally is with regard to custody. Although, although as I just mentioned, Coinbase has a recently announced custody offering, and there's a few other uh, services available today, this is not a mature, developed space. There are many institutional investors out there that don't feel comfortable with the quality and development of the custody offerings out there today. And then the third uh, bucket of infrastructure requirements I think any asset class needs is something I'll broadly call prime services. And that includes things uh, that Mike mentioned earlier, like the ability to borrow and lend a crypto asset, ability to short it, um, but also crucially, the ability to trade it in a manner that's decoupled from the point of custody, and that's simply not possible today. So uh, trading venues, I think we're well on our way. Custody is very much a work in progress, and prime services is something that we simply need to build. Coinbase is working hard on that problem in particular, and I'm hopeful that over the next few months, you'll see some announcements from us about the work we're doing in the prime services space. Yeah, and I think the, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the thing that I would add is when we look at the kind of the infrastructure question, uh, I think where we see it in the broader, either whether we're looking at like the transactional handshake or how people are managing risk or how people are accessing exposure to cryptocurrencies or crypto assets such as Bitcoin, is that it is a high degree of interest. There is a lot of fever around it. There's a lot of attention, but there's also corresponding a lot of unfamiliarity with what do I do? How do I access this? This is new. This is nascent technology. You know, these are, these are phrases that you hear people talking about. And what they're really talking about, too, is I'm not quite sure how my existing infrastructure plugs and plays with this new, unique technology offering and thing that has developed uh, over the last few years. So from CME's perspective, when we first launched the Bitcoin reference rate back in 2016, there was this upwelling of interest from customers. Uh, we looked to kind of demand-driven and customer-driven innovation at CME, and then we were getting a lot of questions of, well, you know, what do we, what, how do I do this? Um, how do I access this? How do I trade this? And that's what really steered our product development to offering the U.S. dollar financially settled contract, you know, because we could actually provide exposure to Bitcoin in a way that plugged and played with the existing infrastructure. In terms of it being a financially settled contract against an index or a reference rate, in terms of how it operates through the machine, of how it gets cleared, it is no different than a future on the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Russell 2000, the Dow, et cetera. It really works through the machine the same way. It's an arithmetic computation, exchanging payments relayed, uh, related to this reference rate. So that's something I think that we thought about where the infrastructure isn't quite there, and that was one of the strong pulls or demands from customers about why people wanted a future on Bitcoin at CME, uh, in addition to things like being a regulated marketplace, but it just, it worked with the way they risk managed their other risks and contracts. So Genesis started in 2013, um, and here we are in 2018, and the fact that there is a conference like this uh, with all of you in attendance with the CME trading a futures contract. That's, that is such a massive leap and bound movement from where we've sort of started in 2013 to kind of where we are now. So clearly we're headed in the right direction in terms of making this asset class have the look and feel um, of it being a truly in, uh, institutional experience. So that's step one. Step two, ultimately, is, and, and I'll add to one of the other things, what you see in more matured markets is kind of the, the, the regulated ETF um, and sort of an easy way in the public equity market to be able to access um, a Bitcoin ETF. Obviously, the SEC has expressed its view um, in sort of the, the rejections of the few of the ETFs that filed throughout 2017. Um, personally, I don't believe that we'll see anything this year, perhaps next year. Um, I'm thinking probably sort of 2020 ultimately kind of time frame, but um, part of that is rules and regs. Um, who regulates crypto? Is there a bifurcation between SEC regulating tokens and cryptocurrencies belonging to the CFTC? And we finally get a federal regulator as opposed to kind of the state by state thing that we're dealing with at present. Um, and ultimately the formation of SROs, um, could there be an industry wide effort to create a self-regulatory body to oversee, make sure market manipulation and things like that aren't ultimately happening at the exchange level, which will give the SEC comfort that uh, retail, a product that is accessible to retail in an ETF, is ready. 
The challenge, of course, is that Bitcoin is global and, cr uh, and, and cross-jurisdictionally, can you do a global SRO? Um, or if it's just the US, is that good enough for the SEC if they miss whatever, 30, 40, 50% of the overall uh, spot market, is that still good enough for the SEC and give them comf enough comfort to know that they have enough of a surveillance into it? Um, those are all things that ultimately kind of need to happen before we kind of reach the, the true institutions. Obviously, I'm sure at some point, Hughes, former employer in State Streets and the, the BNY Mellons and, and the Fidelities will figure out and try to figure out their way, and that could be kind of the last step, ultimately to the true institutionalization of the asset class. Infrastructure-wise, we're still early, but we've come a long way, and I'm incredibly excited about the direction that all of this is ultimately heading. And I also wanted to reference what the difference is between custing a digital asset versus custing a traditional one. I think a lot of people in this room have been getting a primer on how this technology works, but I think just like drawing out that difference right now for people so they understand kind of what the what the challenges are would be great. Hey, Vaughn, let's use, go for sure, it. I'll start. I'll start with that. So, custing a traditional financial asset, uh, given the vast majority of financial assets are what's called um, instrument registered as opposed to bearer assets. It's fairly simple. You have a third party uh, trusted source. They record the title uh, for the ownership of an asset in a ledger and that's made publicly available to the market. Custodying a digital asset is much harder because effectively what you're doing there is securely storing a secret. Now, as we've seen time and time again, storing secrets, particularly in the digital domain, given the headlines we see every day about data breaches, is really, really hard to do. And who else wants to discuss? Yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, look, I would, my undergrad is electrical engineering. My first job was programming. And programming an IBM research lab. And one of that first project was around uh, multi-factor authentication, smart car authentication, and public key cryptography. So any of you guys here are familiar with technology side of things, everything blockchain, crypto, is based fundamentally on public key cryptography. And the custody of a crypto asset is nothing more than Kayvon alluded to, is just storing of that private key. It's a bearer asset. Whoever has the password or the mechanism to unlock that private key now owns all the assets associated with the account there. So really, you're just talking about scoring secrets. Um, and you know, whichever company holds out that secret is at the, at the attack front, and everybody wants to go after it. So um, it is a technology play, but a big bunch of that is actually around um, you know, compliance and surveillance and, and, and just procedures around it. When you hear about cold storage, that's nothing really more than a computer storing that secret that's not connected to the internet, so you have to have a person who you know, puts a little flob in there and, and grab that key out. But I think a lot of ways we talk about custody right now is still thinking about it a very traditional way. Like, how do we protect a secret? Like, if we slow, that, if we slow the process of retrieving that, then we think it's more secure. We keep it offline, we think it's more secure. But there's actually a lot of technology companies out there figuring out ways to decentralize ways of storing a secret. So it's almost using like the concept of a crypto and a decentralized environment to change custody. Now, is any of that gonna play into this institutional finance stuff that we're talking about now? I don't think so. I mean, those are 10, 20 years down the road type stuff. But immediately, it is gonna be someone like a Coinbase and a GDAX offering a more institutional-like system, and ultimately, someone like a State Street, a Fidelity, a Boney, one of these guys really coming in and putting their, you know, putting their name behind it to hold that asset for you. But we're not that far from that, I don't think. I have a question about that, because in this world where everyone is saying that the reason that something like Bitcoin is so powerful is because it's trustless, meaning that you don't have to trust a third party, here we are talking about these companies that you would eventually trust to do the custody, and we already see this fissure in the crypto space where there are certain people who say, oh, you should always hold your private keys, you should never trust anybody to do them for you, and then other people, as you can see from the millions of users at Coinbase, are plenty happy to trust other people to manage their private keys. And I've also even interviewed Mike Belshi of BitGo, which recently acquired one of the qualified custodians in the space. I think it might be the first one to uh, be a qualified custodian of digital assets, but they uh, uh, purchased Kingdom Trust, which is this qualified custodian, and I asked him how it worked, and he was like, oh, well, you know, within the company, there's different teams that know pieces of the private key, 
but nobody knows who everybody is on, on this team, not even me. And so it's just kind of interesting to hear him say, okay, we're all within the same company, but not everybody even knows who, who holds all the pieces to these keys. So can you talk a little bit about the philosophical differences and how that plays into choices you might make and how to custody digital assets? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll touch that one for a second. Um, so I think the beauty of Bitcoin is it gives you the option to hold your own private key to kind of control your own funds. Whether you choose to exercise that option is entirely kind of up to the individual. So my own crypto holdings, yes, I would hold the private keys to all of the crypto holdings that I personally have. Um, separately though, at the institutional level for this audience, um, there's this concept of how institutions are not allowed to self-custody the assets that they've invested in. So there's the concept of the qualified custodian, which kind of plays into the BitGo and the Kingdom Trust, where they have to pick a third party service provider to ultimately hold the crypto assets that, the, uh, that their uh, limited partners have ultimately kind of invested into. So it, it, legally, if they're supposed or if they're forced to have to trust a third party, it's who the best of the, uh, the custodians that are sort of available out there. Frankly, the institutions that we speak to, it's all liability, right? They don't want to hold the private key. For God forbid they lose it or it gets destroyed, there isn't like a forgot password button in Bitcoin. It's gone. The assets are gone forever. Um, and so in that kind of setting, would you rather trust yourself and your IT team, or would you rather trust a, a professional whose business it is to ultimately kind of guard that secret? Um, but, you know, it's a question, it's an open question for me as to whether or not the, the Wellingtons of the world um, are going to get comfortable with the Coinbase kind of the solution, or they really are waiting for the the State Streets and the BNY Mellons to kind of enter the space because uh, no technologist would promise you that they're hack proof, right? It's not like State Street's gonna build something that is ultimately more secure than what Coinbase custody product is from a technological perspective. But it's that you think there's more capital behind State Street and so if they're hacked, that they'll somehow provide the, the self-insurance around the assets and that they'll make the accounts whole should they be hacked by a third party. So ultimately, is it a combination of the, the Coinbase custody-like product with an insurance wrap from a third-party provider that sort of guards against thefts that will get the industry over the hump? Or are they truly waiting for the historical custodians to kind of ultimately step in play? But that may be years from now. I don't have a sense of timing for when that ultimately may happen. Um, but it's, it's, it's so the opportunity and kind of the risk-reward is What's available today? What are the best available products and services that are available today? And kind of go with it, or wait for, for the industry to be much more mature um, in three years when the other guys kind of enter the space. But then ultimately, maybe the upside on the price appreciation is gone by then. So it's, 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 a, it's a give and take as to what you're ultimately kind of looking for. And I'll, I'll add a little to that too, is that a lot of time when we talk about something new like this, like everybody, the industry think of it as something mutually exclusive. You're either decentralized or you're centralized. One of those are gonna win, right? You either have a perfect solution like a State Street coming in or I won't go in. It, it never rarely works like that in any of these area, right? We are gonna have semi-centralized system versus decentralized system. And the solutions that we have right now in terms of custody or trading or all kinds of stuff, it's not perfect, but it's, it is very workable. So in terms of our client segment, we have people that are uh, absolute crypto funds, right? People that are 25 years old who's raised $50 million and they go out and do this. And they're perfectly happy with storing this on a floppy drive and walking around with it. And then you have people that are quantitative hedge funds, which can carve out a separate piece that's under 150 million bucks, and they can do this on their own cold storage. And then you have the bigger, bigger guys who are just saying, oh, you know, I'm not quite ready. I wanna learn what's available before I dive in. So the solutions are not perfect, but they're absolutely available today for the institutions to get into this market. And I think the one thing <clears throat> that I would add is that I don't think this is just kind of a, you know, an either or question, right? You know, in terms of what is a custodian's custodial solution. I think when you think about it is what are the implications of getting custody correct for the ecosystem? And that's where when you think about other financial markets, other liquidity pools that exist, other products that are out there, is from our perspective, it's very important to be supportive of the symbiotic relationship between things like the spot market and the futures market, or the OTC, or how miners are interacting with pure financial speculating firms uh, that are just looking to trade. 
And custody, I think, is something that will help with that interrelatedness. It will help with that increased efficiency because it will allow other mechanisms, whether it be things like EFPs or swaps or transfers or delivery, these will become more and more important as the ecosystem continues to grow. And I think that's also where it's not just a, how do I store my, my Bitcoin now? It's, I think, how did the question that we also need to be mindful of and be challenging ourselves to answer correctly is, what does this mean for the next iterative step in the development of the velocity or the transactional handshakes that exist in the Bitcoin or crypto asset ecosystem? And how do these custody solutions prevent against an, a malicious employee kind of, you know, a tampering in some fashion or stealing these funds? Yeah, maybe I'll take a stab at that. So at Coinbase, we emphasize that custody is much more than a technical or engineering solution, although we think that's a key foundational layer. It's also about people and process and culture. So Coinbase, ever since we were, you know, came to market in 2012, we've been storing crypto assets for all our customers, probably at the greatest scale in the world today. We've custody more than $20 billion in crypto assets for both our retail and institutional customers. Um, and we have more than 20 million customers on our platform globally. So it's something we've been doing well. And to answer your question about you know, wh what it means to prevent insider attacks and that kind of thing, you embed thinking about um, distributed security within your organization, uh, within how you think about hiring people to make sure there are no single points of failure and additional redundant layers where whenever you're engineering a system, you assume that other systems adjacent to it that can touch it or talk to it have already been compromised. And you, organize, you design that module with the assumption that anything it's talking to may not be trusted. And so layers of security upon layers of security pervade our engineering culture. And is that something that can be easily scaled? Or is, I mean, you know, I, not that, I mean, obviously Coinbase is quite big for this space, but if we're talking about Wall Street coming and that's a really different ball game. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's easy to scale. In fact, the one thing that we've learned in the many years that we've been doing custody is that scaling custody, be it in terms of number of, of investors, be it in terms of the amount of assets, or be it in terms of the number of assets you support and the engineering and payment rails required to hook into those different blockchains, that stuff is really hard. Um, and our security team, if I had to point to sort of the core secret sauce of what makes Coinbase special and what makes us different from any other platform provider in the crypto space is that we have that core security knowledge around crypto, uh, which is not easy to replicate. Yeah, well, actually, that goes back to my previous question, too, about the difference between custing a traditional asset versus a digital asset. Then even within digital assets, what are all the things that you need to factor in when you're trying to figure out how to custody? Because I imagine custodying, I don't know, I'm going to make this up, like the ether is different from um, <coughs> That's right. I'll give you an example. So some other custody offerings on the market today rely on what's called multi-seek technology to require a, a three-way agreement between the parties involved to process a withdrawal transaction. Um, that's not the model we use. And one of the reasons for that is that multi-sig, um, the cryptography, cryptography behind it is actually natively built in to the blockchain in the underlying cryptocurrency. So if the underlying cryptocurrency doesn't support multi-sig transactions, you will not be able to put that on a multi-sig base custody platform. And so the approach we've taken is to, rather than using multi-sig technology, which won't necessarily scale across many, many assets, we're using what's called Samir's uh, secret sharing, which is a way of sharding the private keys associated uh, with a, a private, uh, sharding the pieces of the private key and distributing it to multiple third parties to achieve the same outcome, which is requiring the agreement of multiple parties before any withdrawal can be made, but doing so in a much more scalable fashion. So although custody is a really big issue, there's plenty of other things in infrastructure to talk about. Let's talk about trading infrastructure. Where are we now and what needs to be done? Hugh, you want to take that one? That's sure. it. Yeah. The trading side, the one thing I'll add a little bit of that to the custody side, right? So some, a lot of people think that trading always involves custody because Bitcoin is about storing that coin. When you do a transaction, it has to hit the blockchain. But I do want to point out that a lot of institutional trading and, and a lot of institutional trading that's already happening right now is not written to the blockchain every single time you do the transaction, right? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, came on. A lot of the trading that happens within uh, GDAX are central limit order book type 
transactions that don't involve the blockchain until you move the money in and out of GDAX. And a lot of the trading that happened intraday on the, on the Genesis platform do not get settled until you're ready to go and settle that, right? And then the CME piece is just is a cash liver type product, right? So a lot of the trading that's happening today that adds to the aggregate volume um, do not need to hit the blockchain every single time because it's just not really efficient. But in terms of the trading platform, I mean, as I said earlier, right, this is an asset class that we believe started from the retail space. And as a retail individual, you're okay with tracking your portfolio on a spreadsheet. You're okay in logging into four or five different screens and actually just hitting those buttons and doing whatever it is. But when it comes to the institutional side, that is not the case. So, you know, we were hugely surprised when we started talking to funds and stuff. And, and the biggest competitor that we have really is Microsoft. It's Excel, and it's Google, it's Google Sheets. That's what people are using for, uh, for, ac for account management, they're, that's what they're using for portfolio management, and you know, people are forced to sort of build a technology team to connect to a lot of different places. And the other thing to recognize too is that most of these exchanges that we're talking about um, are not traditional exchanges, so they're using very different API than what a Goldman would provide you, right? What a fixed API would provide you. So um, in order, for a, an investment fund to be able to access the pool of liquidity that is electronic or the voice liquidity that are being priced over OTC desk is hugely cumbersome. So what we're trying to do is basically take this asset class, fit it into something that you already recognize. You know, if you currently use Charles River for your OMS, you're gonna be very familiar to the things that we use. Um, if you currently use various different EMS systems, we have the EMS system built in so that you can take this and truly treat it as an asset class. You don't have to believe that 30 years from now, the centralized government is gone, right? You need to use this because it, you have a multi-asset class portfolio, this gives you an uncorrelated return characteristic, and you just wanna own it because it has appreciation value, and we give you the platform for that. So I think you know, that's what we're trying to do, right? Make this seem like a real asset class and make the access to all the different marketplaces or endpoints, whether it's custodian, fund accounting, liquidity, easier. So think of us as just you know, we're, we're the super highway, we're the plumbing, we're the picks and shovel that gets you access to all these gentlemen here. Yeah, to, to whose point, it's all about us adapting the crypto space to meet the needs of the institutional investor, as opposed to expecting institutional investors to change the way they operate or changing their platforms to plug into us. So to give you a few more examples, um, you know, one thing that GDAX, our exchange, supports and has supported for many years is a fixed protocol, which many higher velocity traders use. Another thing we're gonna be rolling out in the near future is OTC block trading services with manned by a live execution services desk based in New York City. Why? Because that's what a lot of institutional investors want. So what we're doing at Coinbase is meeting institutional investors on their terms rather than on ours. Yeah, and I think that when we're looking at the transactional infrastructure, you know, kind of like I was saying before, like one of our central tenets for designing the product was to make sure it worked and felt like every other futures contract. But that's just one element of the transactional handshake. When you think about the other transactional infrastructure that we are responsible for as an exchange operator, it's bringing together the network of customers that we currently have to actually create the liquid, efficient, transparent price discovery that people expect of a futures contract. And that's something that we thought was very important for something like Bitcoin futures when we were moving into it and why we kind of, you know, we're listening to customers in that kind of, you know, one year run up between the announcement of the reference rate and then the launch of the future was because we wanted to make sure we had that balanced transactional pool between customer segments. You have natural uh, transaction participants, or whether they're, they're miners or they've accumulated Bitcoin uh, on spot transactions, such on Coinbase. Uh, they may have a, a risk uh, perspective where they just want to be speculative and say they want to trade the volatility of the asset class. And then in the middle, you have these people who want to use futures as an, a primary access vehicle because they want to either trade on a regulated exchange or they want to avoid some of the kind of infrastructure complications we're talking about here in transacting uh, spot Bitcoin or mining Bitcoin. So when you put all those together, that's also very important in terms of the transactional infrastructure because you need that balanced participation for the market to trade, for the market to move, for the market to absorb uh, volume on outsized days. Like yesterday, we actually had a record in Bitcoin futures where we traded a little bit over 5,200 contracts or almost 26,000 Bitcoin. The fact that you know the average is only about 2,200 outside of yesterday, that the market has to be ready to almost do a 2x or 3x volume 
with very little notice. And that's something as the exchange operator, it's also making sure that the transactional uh, ecosystem or the marketplace that people are operating in is built efficiently to handle that and they trust the rules of the road. So that's why we still have risk safeguards, we have clearing safeguards, we have credit controls. All these things around the transactional handshake are also, I think, equally important to make sure that when people want to trade or when people need to trade, they can do so uh, in an efficient and a forecastable manner. Um, from a liquidity perspective, I mean, there's dozens of exchanges globally. Um, and, and some people argue that's good because it creates arbitrage opportunities. Uh, but um, it, it, in a different way, um, you have to pre-fund every single one of them, uh, fiat and crypto, to be able to kind of trade it. Um, and while, while crypto is relatively easy to kind of move from exchange to exchange, moving fiat around between them, uh, that's a challenge. Um, and so even though there's venues of liquidity, it's not sort of readily accessible um, at any time. Um, and so not only can you not take advantage of just ARB opportunities that kind of exist, but that liquidity may be two days away because you got a fund that's a swift wire and it may take 48 hours before you can ultimately kind of get it there. Um, so from an infrastructure perspective, I think we'll kind of get to a point where you don't necessarily need to maintain a fund at every single one of them to ultimately kind of be able to trade on them. Um, and, 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 and otherwise, it's too, the assets and, and, and are too sort of siloed at each of these exchanges, and it's difficult to ultimately kind of trade and access that level of global liquidity. Separately, there's kind of the settlements problem because there is no DTC um, in, in crypto. Um, especially sort of on the over-the-counter side, which is, which is my market. Um, someone has to act first. Um, there isn't sort of the DVP type of settlement that you'll see in other markets. And so um, for, for Genesis, it's counterparties have to, we agree to a trade, counterparties have to send us the wire, and then we send them the Bitcoin. So the counterparties have to trust Genesis that once we receive the wire that they get the crypto. But the bigger risk, obviously, is that the counterparty does a trade and because Bitcoin is so volatile, they default and don't send you the wire because the price moved. And so there's sort of settlement counterparty risk that exists in the OTC market, um, which is just a, a risk that's kind of inherent in this current business model and kind of ultimately where we are. And whether or not there is sort of a, a clearinghouse that'll be formed in the future that is independent of the OTC kind of liquidity venues that'll help to settle the transactions, or there's an, uh, a newer version of the escrow service. Maybe there's a, um, a smart contract solution via stablecoin where things can ultimately kind of get settled in a much more efficient, trustless kind of way. Um, but we are um, in a world in which we're still talking about who moves first. Uh, if Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are trying to do an OTC trade and you're trying to argue about who does the trade, who sends the wire in first, um, there really isn't sort of a good protocol and kind of system for kind of doing that in a third party kind of independent kind of way. So I feel think, I still think that that's coming. We're already here with listed futures. There we go. Right? <laughs> I'll add it just real quickly on that too, because you can tell by the way we're talking, right? This is really talking about how to trade this totally new asset class that we don't quite figure out what the future intrinsic value is yet, but we're talking about it in a context that's very traditional marketplace in a traditional financial environment. So I think the two really is married together. And then there are very real issues such as performance, right? We're currently obviously not at a high frequency trading level yet, but exchanges are falling over anytime the, the, uh, the volume or, or price is a spiking. Um, and then, so we gotta protect that kind of stuff. So I think all the exchanges are getting themselves better at it. And then you have guys like us coming in here. So we, our system is actually run in a data center in NY5 that's just turned on last week, but we also have a web infrastructure for non-time sensitive stuff that are privately tied together. And you know, one of our investors is Jump Trading and Jump Capital, and these guys are already quietly being market makers both on the OTC side as well as electronically on the exchanges. So the number of people that are involved right now solving it from a technology perspective and also from a liquidity perspective, from a credit perspective, from a custodian perspective, is, um, is mind-boggling, actually, the number of existing institutions that are already working on those problems. One question I wanted to ask about the liquidity issue that you mentioned, Michael, is you mentioned that some of the ways to resolve it might be using something like a stable coin, or maybe there might be an organization sort of, you know, for settlement. Um, what dire direction do you think things are going? Because if I look at sort of every, 
all the activity in the open source world, everybody's always talking about stable coins and says, you know, this is the future. Um, but I can see maybe uh, from the Wall Street perspective that something more like an organization that kind of follows a model that they're used to might be more appealing. I just want to know if you see kind of the wind moving in one direction or another. I think the, um, the OTC market makers will ultimately get comfortable potentially with a stable coin solution. Um, there's certainly too many of them um, at, at this point in time, and while they're all kind of interesting and kind of different in a way, sort of a coin just simply pegged to the dollar um, for, this, uh, for, for settlement crypto to crypto um, is certainly interesting. Um, the challenges are going to be, um, will the banks ultimately kind of support it? Uh, will a, a, a major bank be kind of standing behind or a network of, of banks being able to say, okay, this dollar of this coin that I have um, is good for one dollar at any of your institutions. So there's kind of the redeemability of the token vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, one of the banks. Ultimately, at the institutional level, um, that's, that's certainly next level. Um, so USD settlement, pure USD, is probably going to be the way that um, most of the hedge funds and sort of the family offices will sort of buy and sell the cryptocurrency. Um, but because this thing is 24-7, um, the ability to be able to settle at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. when the banking hours are closed um, is of utmost importance kind of in the OTC market. And the, and the only way to really kind of do this is if you have a tokenized version of the U.S. dollar um, so that you can ultimately get comfortable that you're hedging off that price risk on the crypto side with the stable coin on the other side. And there's lots of initiatives kind of underway to kind of help solve that problem, but it's a way to have continuous settlement regardless of whether or not the banks are open um, is going to be one of the key factors that I think that will drive this market forward. Well, I also wanted to ask about that. Is the fact that these markets are 24-7, 365, does that present any specific challenges in building out the trading infrastructure? Because obviously that is not the case with traditional financial markets. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Um, as we're an exchange operator, keeping... Uh, our matching engine running 24-7, 365. As who pointed out, it's been a challenge for us as well as many other exchanges. Something I think we're getting much better at, particularly since, um, since December when we had record high trading volumes. We're also in the process of moving our core matching engine to a dedicated um, um, uh, non-cloud uh, type model. We'll have some more details on that later in the year, but moves like that are gonna increase the reliability determinism of our exchange in a 24-7, 365 context. Yeah, I think it's a challenge, right? Because even on the future side, um, you know, where we offer near 24 hours a day, uh, with the exception kind of Saturday and, and part of Sunday, that that used to be, I think, um, sufficient for 24-hour access. But when we're looking at Bitcoin, kind of solving this weekend problem at the exchange is presenting unique uh, issues for us to address, whether from a risk management perspective or from a technology perspective. Uh, th simple things is like how do we manage uh, circuit breakers or price limits over the weekend, or how do we reseed prices on a Sunday afternoon? Because the market, the underlying market, never closes, which is a, a new paradigm for us to deal with. But when you look then at some of the conversations around, well, do we still need things like maintenance windows or trading halls throughout the day? And the answer is yes, because the trade-off for us from the exchange perspective is those are critical for us to run clearing cycles, uh, introduce new products, you know, uh, introduce patches to uh, technology fixes. So there's still a, a need for uh, periods of discontinuity uh, in the trading cycle that we're, that we're continuing to work through. But I think one of the things that it for sure is unique and I think may challenge the broader financial industry going forward is if the underlying market never truly closes, how do some of us react to make sure that we maintain that touch point uh, and kind of that interrelatedness I was speaking to before, but the trade-off will be the kind of tried and trusted approach to maintaining uptime and technology for continuity of trading. Some of those, some of those areas are already being solved um, by people that are not on this panel. That there are banks that are starting to work 24/7. There are banks that are using non-leveraged ways of holding assets to essentially do the tri-party model, probably moving to a four-party model so that the two counterparties don't have to have the same banks going forward. Um, I think in, in the institutional space, I don't, I don't know if that's really that hugely important at the moment because people have. There, there, people need to sleep still. So the number of hedge funds that actually trade 24 seven is not that, uh, there's not that many of them, right? So in terms of keeping the technology stable, keeping everything working perfectly, a five minute downtime on a Saturday to refresh the system, 
um, if you provide that as a term of service, as an SLA, and people understand it, uh, at least we haven't seen those kind of issues. I think people care more about the, stable, the system being stable when it is up rather than you know, needing it to do 24-7. I think if you need a 24-7, there are a lot of decentralized systems or retail type exchanges that will keep that going. But for the institutional space, I think we have some time to get into that and it's not gonna hamper the adoption rate. So the other thing that everybody's talking about on the public side is decentralized exchanges. I think we've hit on some of the big trends, stable coins is one of them, but decentralized exchange is definitely another. That's where you can have a protocol where exchange can be done in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. You can also put more centralized services on those that run order books and do some matching or enable people to, um, to, to see orders and, and take certain orders. So do you ever see this kind of technology being used by more traditional players or do you, or even other kinds of technologies that are being talked about in the decentralized world like atomic swaps? Yeah, I, I think the answer is absolutely. And at Coinbase, we're actually pretty excited about the possibilities created by decentralized exchanges and relays. <clears throat> as, an, as a centralized exchange operator, we frequently get asked the question, do we view these as a threat or, or somehow replacing or competing with or centralized exchange? And the answer is no. We think the cryptocurrency space is diverse enough that you're going to have different types of customers with different needs. So folks for which uh, latency and velocity of trading is the most important thing to their business model will gravitate towards centralized exchanges like GDAX. And folks that care more about the status of the, the custody of their assets and the security around movement of those assets and potentially confidentiality will gravitate towards relays and decentralized exchanges. All right, and I think, do we have time for some questions? Okay, great. Anybody have any questions? Um, so on your custody solution, you're not Goldman Sachs, you're not JP Morgan. When, when are a real institutional quality prime broker custodian coming into the space? Yeah, so Mike touched on this point earlier and I thought it was, it was a really good point, is that there's always gonna be a universe of more conservative in institutional investors out there that regardless of the quality of your security or technology or team are simply not gonna trust using you to custody on an institutional scale because you don't have a sufficiently large balance sheet and the brand name associated with that. We think, as Mike mentioned, there's a few solutions to that. One of the solutions that we're exploring at Coinbase is the idea of partnering with third-party large insurance underwriters. This is something that we already do to ensure the assets inside the hot wallet inside Coinbase. And so it's just a question of scaling that to cover more assets and getting it more underwriting appetite, uh, appetite on board. We're also exploring other solutions, but we recognize the need to have a large balance sheet underpinning um, a high quality institutional custody offer. What are prime brokers coming into this space? Again, you know, high quality prime brokers. Yeah. Um, this is something that we're looking at. Um, I think, no, no, we're not, but I'd argue that we have uh, in many ways, a greater sense of what crypto investors want. We don't have the same balance sheet. But from a technology and trading perspective, I think we can potentially move faster than some of the larger slowing moving banks. That said, I think it, it is a matter of time before the larger investment banks do look at things like crypto prime brokerage and margin finance in the crypto space because they have massive balance sheets and, and great expertise around that. So there's gonna be a sense of potentially a race to fill what's currently a really big gap in the market and you know, may, may the best platforms win. Ultimately, I think the space is gonna be big enough that we're gonna have a variety of platforms that are gonna serve that need. But I, think, I think maybe one thing I would add though, right? Because I think it's, it's come up in some other panels and I think it's, it's kind of percolating in some questions here. The one thing I would maybe just, just add is that we have to challenge ourselves in the financial industry is to make sure that we're also not bringing a legacy bias to building this new marketplace. And we also have to think, you know, we use the term institutional investor. The thing to pay attention to is that definition is rapidly changing with respect to crypto assets. You have the advent of crypto only hedge funds. You have the migration of trading personnel from very established firms uh, to starting up their own firms using what they've learned to in this new and kind of uh, evolving landscape. So I think that's something that we just have to be very mindful of is that this is changing. 
and that we have to evolve with it. We have to stay in front of it. We can't use necessarily that, that same approach that we've used historically, and whether it's on the product innovation side or offering out uh, products from funds and things like that, it also, I think I would just ask people to challenge themselves. It's not necessarily whether or not I, as the individual, believe in something like Bitcoin. It's about paying attention to what's going on around me. And is this generational? Will this be different in five years from now? Will this be different in 10 years from now? And it's not about your personal belief. It's about whether or not you can, in an agnostic manner, look at the ecosystem and come up with a thesis of where this is going and ask, your, ask yourself, how do I add value to what is happening around me? I was going to say a little bit. Um, to think that banks like Goldman or JP or City or State Street is actually going to start by saying, hey, I want to truly be innovative, and I want to create this new solution to solve this market problem. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have been in banks, and I have been in this one for the last 10 years. It doesn't happen, right? And part of that is not because they don't want it to happen. It's the regulatory pressure and everything required to keep things safe. So I think this is going to come from the buy side, right? And some of these, this, these crypto funds are very much on the vanguards of this, but the size just isn't there, right? When, when you, somebody's raising $100 million or $200 million to do this fund, you can satisfy that with the existing infrastructures. There's no need for the Goldman's to get in. But when you have a Wellington or some bigger one with trillions of dollars and they really want to move into this market, there's two problems. One is the traditional financial services. We don't have this system yet. But let's realize this is a $400 billion market cap. The entire asset class, somebody wants to move $200 million into it, that eats up 100% of your Bitcoin. So a lot of things have to happen together. Let's not expect the banks to get in there next three months or six months or even a year, right? And you, as a lot of the buy sides, when you buy into this asset class and you feel like there's long-term value and you want to hold it or trade it in your multi-asset class portfolio, pick up the phone, call your banker. That, I think, is a real driver. Um, and that's what made me want to leave State Street when I started hearing those kind of requests coming in from the clients knowing that my bank is not going to be able to do that, and I go and build that. Maybe as a, as a follow-up, I guess my question would be for you, Kayvon. What, obviously, you're not Goldman, and you're, you're not one of those entities, but you have been at the forefront of this industry for a long time. So what are you doing to ensure um, that when you offer a custodian offering, that you can protect the assets that you'll be, that you'll be holding? And so you don't have a balance sheet to back that up. So besides the technology bill that you'll have, what are you doing to uh, make your clients comfortable? Yeah, a, a number of things. So um, uh, we have the notion of qualified custody, which is a legal designation that's uh, a requirement for many large hedge fund investors in the space. So there's an element of, of legal protection there. Uh, but more broadly, as I mentioned to Laura earlier, it's about people, process, and culture to pervade your engineering and your organization, the people you hired to do that. But ultimately, as, as you alluded to, like we can have the best in class for all of those things, and large investors are not going to feel that's enough without a big balance sheet to backstop that. So I really think that partnering with someone with a big balance sheet like third-party insurance or, or other arrangements uh, is going to ultimately be the way to go to fully penetrate that custody space. OK, great. I think that's time, all the time we have for this panel, so thank you so much. Thank you.